2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. O oh, ye Corinthians, our mouth is opened unto you and our heart is enlarged. You're not straightened in us, but you're straightened in your own bowels. Now for recompense in the same I speak unto my children, be ye also enlarged. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial, what part hath he with the believer that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they should be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Chapter 7, verse 1 is my text. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting wholeness in the fear of God. Clean up, he said, from the filthiness of the flesh and spirit. So I want to speak to you today about the sins of the spirit of man. I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about the spirit of man. Now man is a trinity. He has a body, soul, and spirit according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. The body is the part that you see. The soul is our self-conscious nature and the spirit nature of man makes him God conscious of course. But there's some sins of the Spirit we need to check about today and clean up from that we might be better Christians to the glory of God. Number one, there is a sin of pride. The Bible said that in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18, pride goeth before destruction and the Holy Spirit before fall. The word pride is synonymous with the word boast or boasting. We're living in a day and hour when there's a lot of boasting and bragging and people fill with pride. A lot of people, bless their hearts, never had anything in this life, maybe for a period of time, and then they begin to accumulate something, and then they get the big head and, and high hat you. They wouldn't speak to you on the street if they met you. You have some like that. And you have some in the spiritual realm today in the church. Sometimes they get full of pride over what they're doing. And if the devil can get you filled with pride over what you're doing and over the gift you have, then he's on the way of wrecking you. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 23, a man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. If God blesses you and God is using you, then humble yourself and he'll use you even more. Every true born again believer has a gift. No doubt about that. Everyone. When God saves you, you have a gift. And you need to develop that gift and find out by the leadership of God's Spirit as to just what it is. And God will use you in that particular field. He'll add more gifts and talent if you use what you have. Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4 and verse 37. The Bible said he walked in great pride and began to brag about what he had done. And he had built a mighty kingdom there in the great city of Babylon. And he was so full of pride until God drove him out like an ox. And for years he went out and ate grass like an ox. And there his hair grew out and his fingernails grew out, his toenails grew out uh, like an animal. And God allowed him to go out there for all those seven years and to bring him down, to humble him. And it took that to humble Nebuchadnezzar. Now God knows exactly how to let the air out of your little balloon. Now, many people have heard me tell about this dear old lady that made a statement about the young preacher that just came out of the seminary and he came into the old country church where the old preacher had been for years. The dear old pastor hadn't had the privilege of attending a seminary or college and he was coming back home and, and the pastor gave him an opportunity to speak and he was going to show the people something, maybe something they'd never heard from their pastor, he came strutting into the pulpit throughout his chest and made the biggest flop you ever saw. He just couldn't get into his message. He couldn't speak well and he just 
He just made a turbo flop in his preaching. He was so humiliated whenever he finally finished, he walked down out of the pulpit and bowed his head and wouldn't even look at the people and walked down the aisle of the back of the church. There's a dear old lady sitting down on the front pew and she made this statement. She said, if that young man had gone in the pulpit like he'd come out, he'd come out like he went in. And how true that is. If God is blessing you and using you, you need to be humble. You remember back years ago, the German army, you know, those SS troops and uh, the German troops over there in the parades, they would do the goose step and march around and showing off their strength. And they were filled with pride. They said, we are the super race. And we're going to do away with all the Jews in the world. And we're going to have a supper in the White House Christmas time. That was Hitler's boast. But where are they today? You see how they were humble. They are not goose-stepping today. Not those that goose-stepped in those days. Beloved, that great pride. God brought them down. There's a nut one time as uh, shaping his long blade knife. Somebody asked him what he's going to do with it. He replied, I'm going to cut off Ben Brown's head off, cut his head off and turn him around so he can see where he came from. The man is so full of pride, he forgot about the pit from which he was digged. So this poor ignorant man said he just cut his head off, turn him around so he can see where he came from. Maybe be humble. Many years ago at one of the uh, peach bowls in Atlanta, Georgia, after the uh, early part of the beginning of the Peace Bowl time whenever uh, Governor Maddox was governor of Georgia. And he got on his bicycle and rode around on the inside of, of the court there to show the people how he could ride backwards on his bicycle as good as he could ride forward. One commentator said, you know, said that man had much rather see where he'd been than to find out where he's going. Now, a lot of people like that. You'd rather see where you've been than to find out where you're going. But you need to remember the pit from which you would dig. No doubt about that. Stay humble before God. We do well to remember that. So that's the first sin I want to mention you need to check on. Sin number two is a sin of conceit. In Proverbs chapter 26 and verse 12, Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There's more hope of fool than of that man. Now the Bible said when you become wise, you turn out to be otherwise. If a man becomes so smart and so wise until he has all the answers, the Bible said there's no hope for that individual. Now people can be greatly hurt through a compliment. That is, you can uh, compliment people on certain things and brag on them and sometimes you'll wreck them and if you're not careful, you'll wreck yourself. The sorrows, the youngest, can be hurt through conceit which come from compliments. And we need to be careful how we compliment people unless we know it will help them and it is genuine. J. Frank Norris, a mighty preacher of years gone by, said a preachers are like a wasp, bigger when he's first hatched out than any other time. Now we need to realize the greater we become in the eyes of some, the more humble we ought to be. We need to realize that God makes us what we are. The great uh, Charles E. Fuller, the great founder of the old-fashioned revival hour. He was a tall, handsome, gray-headed man, broad shoulders, hands white as snow. He founded a, a university, a college. Of course, it's gone liberal today, and the liberals and infidels has taken over. And as Charles Fuller knew that, he'd turn over in his grave. But he was leaving the campus one day, and some students sitting up in the uh, up in one of the uh, uh, places where they uh, probably had their class, one of the classrooms, uh, maybe I'll get it straight in a moment, and sitting up there, and they saw him as he, he and his wife walked across the street. And he was a tall, handsome man, very humble man. And when they walked across the street, they saw a little dog that had been hit by an automobile. Charles E. Fuller got out on his knees and picked the little thing up in his hands. He had big old hands, and the little thing was whining, and crying and bleeding and Charles Fuller took it up very tenderly in his hands and carried out and carried it to a veterinarian to see if he could have something done for it. And that did something to those students. He didn't know there were a great number of students watching him. But when they saw that great president of that great university, 
uh, they are doing a thing like that. It humbled them. He did it because he was a humble man. Now the average man in his position would have kicked the dog aside or paid it no attention and went on about his business, but not Charles E. Fuller. That's why he was such a great, great preacher. And then there's a sin of selfishness. The Bible defines selfishness as a pleasing of oneself. In Titus chapter 1 and verse 7, For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God's not self will. Now, if we are not careful, we can become so selfish until it's detrimental to our service for God. You must remember that we need to live for others. I've observed even ministers, since I've been in the ministry, they became very selfish, concerned about themselves and nobody else, like the man and his praying one day, and he said, Lord, bless me and my wife, my son and his wife, us four and no more. Now, a lot of people like to pray like that, but according to the Bible, we need to live for others and not be selfish. Now, when you come to the end of the day, how, how much time have you given in love for yourself? Just think about it. Most of us live for ourselves more than we live for God or anyone else. And we need to realize that we need to be willing to live for others. Out in Shelby, Texas some time ago, there's a great preacher up preaching, and he was encouraging young people to go to the mission field. He had a great concern about the lost people and heathen lands. He is begging. He said, you young people, you need to go. You need to pray about it and plan to go to the mission field. And after a while, his daughter stood up. Beautiful, lovely young daughter, a college student. And she said, Daddy, I'll go. And whenever she said that, that gave him the lockjaw. He, he didn't mean for her to go. He didn't want to lose his daughter to the mission field. But he was persuading other young people to go. But, and when she got up on her feet and said, Dad, I'll go, he didn't know what to say. And sure enough, she went on. She went to the mission field in South America. And right today, doing a great job down there on the mission field. He didn't realize whenever he was trying to get other young people to go that his daughter would be going and he was a little selfish about it. But God got a hold of his heart and today he's proud of the fact that his daughter went to the mission field. Now selfishness will damage you, it'll hurt you, it'll, it'll, it'll sap you spiritually. Now it'll keep you from being a Christian in the matter of Christian giving. Every born again believer ought to be a tither. If you don't give at least one dime out of every dollar that God gives you, then you're acting selfish. That is, if you're saved, if you're lost, you don't, you don't, God don't expect you to give anything because you may go to hell anyway. But if you're saved, God expects that out of you. And if you don't tithe your income, then you're selfish, whether you like it or not. You're selfish and God Almighty is not pleased about it. And if you won't be selfish and look after God's business, then God will look after your business. Now you need to be selfish if you want God's blessings upon you. God said, try me and prove me and see if I will open up the windows of heaven. Now whether you give God his dime out of your dollar or not, that's up to you. But it's not yours. It's not yours. It's God. The first dime out of every dollar that comes your way is God's. Now you give it to him or you keep it for yourself. Now if you're selfish, you'll probably keep it for yourself and turn out to be a thief about the situation, taking God's for yourself. You shouldn't do that. That's wrong. And I want to say this, you can't outgive God. The more you give to God, the more God in turn give back to you because he won't be indebted to any man. So make up your mind, you're not going to be a selfish Christian that you're going to give God his part of your income. Now somebody comes back and says, preach average. I, I'm just really not able to do it. I got a job, got an income, not able to do it. Beloved, uh, you may think you're not able to do it. You're more able to do it than you think you are. And uh, if you don't do it, then it may cost you more if, than if you did, if you didn't do it, if you don't do it. So you need to realize that that's a great principle. Ever since God saved me, I've always given God at least a tenth of my income and even more to the glory of God. God has never let me down and God has taken care of my need. 
You say, preacher, can't afford it. I'm going to tell you something. Won't tell anybody. Don't let this get out. You can't afford not to. It'll cost you more not to than it will if you do. Now, if you don't believe that, you may learn that later. Now, God will take care of you if you'll help look after his business. When you get your income, the first thing you ought to do is say, a dime out of this dollar is God's. That's God's. Uh, Ten dollars out of this hundred is God's. One dollar out of this ten is God's. And you ought to take God's tithe, lay it aside. The other belongs to you. And then God will in turn take that nine tenths, that nine dollars out of the ten, and God will see to it that you can accomplish more and gain more in the long run out of that nine dollars than you would have if you'd kept the ten, yours and God's. Now God knows how to take care of you. He knows how to keep you from having a toothache while you have to go have it pulled. He knows how to keep that automobile or what time from blowing out where you have to buy another side. God, there's a lot of ways that God can take care of you if you'll take care of God. Just go ahead and put God's first and see what happens. And you won't, you won't miss it. You think you can't, but you can't afford not to. Now, God is one of the best collectors that ever lived. He's God. He's always lived. And there comes a time when God says, I'm going to have to collect my tithes. That person kept them, but I'm going to collect them anyway. And God knows your house number, knows your phone number, knows where you live. And God knows how to collect that tithe, and God collect it with interest. I'd rather just go ahead and give it to him from a heart of love because I love him. And uh, then for God to have to come along and take it some other way. Now, that, that's wisdom when you find that out. That, that That's for your benefit and the cause of God. You don't gain a thing. You lose by not tithing if you're born again believer. Now, if you're not saved, I wouldn't ask you to give a dime because you may go to hell anyway. But if you're saved, God is counting on you. That's the way God finances his business. And God looks to his people to take care of it. And that's the sin of ingratitude. That goes along with the sin of the spirit. And 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to pass, unthankful, unholy. The sin of ingratitude. I believe that's one of the major sins of America today. The sin of ingratitude. We throw away more food today than the average nation like India or some other country has to feed on. Do you know that? We just waste and squander and we go to places, buy whatever we want, eat whatever we want. Some countries, they just barely survive on a little bowl of rice or something like in Africa and Ethiopia and other places starving to death. And America is not grateful for that like we ought to be. We all ought to buy our heads before God and thank Him for what we have. The land of plenty, the most powerful nation in the world, the land that God has given us and God has blessed beyond measure. How I want to thank God for it. When Harry S. Truman was president of the United States, Dr. J. Frank Norris was called into the White House. Harry S. Truman said to Dr. Norris, said, Doctor, we have a problem. Said, what, what can we do about the Jew? We have a terrible problem in that respect. Dr. Norris said, uh, Mr. President, said, be kind toward that Jew, and God will be kind toward the nation. And that's exactly what happened. I don't have time to go into it, but that man had the answer. Genesis chapter 12. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 14 and 15, there was a little city and a few men within it. There came a great king against it and besieged it and built a bulwark against it. Now there was in it a... Poor wise man. And by his wisdom he delivered the city. Yet no man remembered that poor wise man. That's Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verses 14 and 15. See whenever the enemy came in this little old insignificant wise man. He had a plan whereby he could defend that city. And he directed the people on how to defend the city. And they did and defeated the enemy. But you know, everybody forgot him. They forgot that little old fellow after it's all over. Now, beloved, listen, Winston Churchill, one of the greatest statesmen that ever lived, is uh, the man that did more to defeat Adolf Hitler and his uh, army than any living man. Churchill wouldn't take no friend. He wouldn't yield. He said, we're going to win. We're going to whip Germany. 
They said they going to whip. No, he said we going to whip Germany. And he wouldn't bend, he wouldn't bow. He stood as straight as an arrow. And he was a key man in defeating Germany. And are you listening to me? As soon as the war is over, they kicked him out. See, people soon forget about those that help them. And those that do things for them. And those that labor day by day. I've known a lot of good preachers, bless your heart. They have been at their church for years and years, give the best part of their life. And then they come to be old and then they are kicked out by the church. And down the road they go with nothing to live on, no income, uh, maybe a little social security. And they're the church. They've given their life to serve. Many of them have uh, retirement funds coming in and so forth. But the poor old preacher, he's got nothing. And I believe that God Almighty will deal with any church that treat a man of God in that manner and turn him out to pasture. Whenever a man gives his time year and year and year and year out, year out in his best part of his life to his church, I believe that church, if they want to do right and love God, want God's blessings, when that dear old man has to leave them, they'll see he's take, have taken care of financially even after he's gone. They ought to do that. If they don't do that, they sin against God. It's wrong to mistreat a man of God in that manner. And a lot of them have been mistreated that way. And many churches have gone under and lost their power and lost their glory because they mistreated the dear old man of God that gave his life. And when he left, he had nothing for his family to live on, his wife to live on, and he to live on, to meet his obligations. And every church where the pastor has been there a number of years ought to make an object of prayer and see to it when their pastor does have to leave, maybe in his old years when he needs to go and feel like he needs to go, they ought to see that his need is taken care of even after he's gone. The church ought to do that as a church, not as just individual, but a church that ought to be voted on, put in the minutes, and see that he and his wife is taken care of the best the church can as long as they live. That's nothing but right. You go out here and work at a company. You stay there 20 years, 30 years. You have a retirement program. There they uh, give you a retirement. You get, you draw your retirement. Maybe to supplement your little social security. And that's nothing but right. But for many, many preachers, they don't have that. When they have to go, they got nothing. And God is not pleased whenever they're not taken care of in that respect. I don't know why I brought all that out, but something maybe you need to hear anyway, because someday you might have a preacher that has spent a long time with you, and you need to take care of him when he's gone. All right. It hurts very deeply when you help someone, and they soon forget it. Oh, how quick they forget you. Many times you can go out and labor and toil. I've organized churches. I've organized churches, got them started, got them going, help people, help preachers, and never been honored enough to even be called back for homecoming in some of them. That's pitiful, isn't it? That's sad. I've helped preachers, got them churches, helped them, stood by them, sacrificed for them, gave them books, did what I could to lead them along. And if I were to visit their church today, they wouldn't call on me to lead in silent prayer. Isn't that something? Oh, listen to me. They soon forget those that help them. Don't ever forget anybody that helps you like that. Regardless of what field it's in, remember them. Remember those that help you. It hurts whenever, of course, you don't do it. That's a sin of ingratitude. Then number five is a sin of discord. Proverbs chapter 6 verse 19, The false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brothers. That's a sin to sow discord. You know what a discord is. Tony can get up here and get things lined up for his song and somebody get off key on the piano organ or one of the instruments and there comes a discord and maybe somebody in the choir throw the whole choir off by being out of tune, too high, too low. Well, that's, 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 that's discord. That's bad. That shouldn't be. And you can very easily sow discord among church members and have them uh, fussing on one another and distrusting each other and talking about each other and criticizing each other. That's wrong. God said he hates discord in the church. It's wrong. It's sinful. Proverbs 6, 19, A false witness is speaking lies, and he that so with discord among brethren. God said, I hate these things. And then there's a sin of criticism. I'm talking about destructive criticism. 
We need to be careful. In, uh, constructive criticism could be helpful, but destructive criticism can be hurtful. And you need to be careful how you criticize people. Unless you know what you're talking about, don't say anything. If you can't offer some good constructive criticism, keep your mouth shut and don't offer any destructive criticism unless you can be of some help and offer up constructive criticism. And we're all guilty of that sometimes, the sin of criticism. And then find it as a sin of influence. In Romans chapter 14 verse 13, let no man put a stumbling block in his brother's way. In Romans chapter 14 verse 7, none of us liveth to himself and no man dies to himself. There's a sin of influence. Now what do you say in preach, Edwards? Some of you might say, well, my, it's, I'm 21 years old or I'll soon be an adult and I do what I want to and I live my life and nobody's business what I do and, and I run my own business and everybody do the same. Well, a lot of people say that and have a good point, but you listen to this preacher. Listen to the word of God. No man liveth to himself, neither does he die to himself. You're influencing someone, some way in your life. You're influencing many people for good or for bad. And you're going to do it while you live. You're going to do it when you die. You have an influence. And you need to be careful about that influence, lest you influence them the wrong way. There's a little boy one time, early one morning, dad got up, his snow on the ground, and dad is going down to the saloon to get some beer to drink, or whiskey, or wine, or some alcoholic beverage of some kind, and got up early, snow about a foot deep, and he started down the saloon, and just before he got there, he heard something behind him, and whenever he turned and looked back, you know what it was? His little boy thought he'd follow daddy. And he was jumping from one of daddy's footsteps to the other. From one to the other, he was moving. From one to the other, right behind his dad. He said, Daddy, look at me. I'm walking in your footsteps. His daddy stopped. He said, where am I going? Where in the world am I going? My boy's walking in my footsteps. And he turned around, he picked that boy up, and he went back home, and he didn't go to the beer saloon anymore. That boy was walking in his footsteps. So we influence our families, our lovers, our friends, our neighbors, our churches, and people we work with, and, and we influence them one way or the other. And you need to check up and see what kind of influence you're offering to your church, your family, the people you work with, your neighbors, your friends. You don't live to yourself, and you don't die to yourself. And you need to remember that. Somebody is watching you, and you're influencing somebody one way or the other. God bless you. Stand to your feet. Father in heaven, I pray that you'll take the message and use it. We know there is the sin of man's spirit. And I pray that you'll drive this message home to our hearts. And help us to know there's a sin of the spirit that we can be guilty of as God's people. Have your way in this invitation, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Debbie's going to play for us. As she does, let me say this to you. If you are here unsaved, or you're here backslidden on God, or you're here and you want to join the church, or you're here and for some reason you feel like you ought to come down here for help, you march down this aisle while she plays the number for us, will you? Door of the church is open. The invitation is extended to you. We give you ample time to respond. Would you obey? How about it? I brought the message God laid on my heart, and that's up to you to do what God tells you to do.